All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, again, we're going to talk about the archetypes today. So if you recall, um, I had listed out the archetypes in a bit of a different way in the past. And this time, we're going to situate the archetypes in, uh, and these are the archetypes of the mind first. And we're going to situate these things um, a little bit differently. And we're going to use the, uh, the metaphor of the iceberg or the image of the iceberg, <laughs> if you can, if you can think about that. So in the iceberg, the conscious level will be above the water and the unconscious level will be below the water. Okay, so if you think of an iceberg and what sticks up above the water, it's kind of the conscious area. And below that is the unconscious. And what I've done is <clears throat> I've taken the, according to Ra, I've taken uh, several of the archetypes that we have uh, and put them where Ra says they are and they're unconscious. And so as you can see in this diagram, and I will try to describe it for, for those maybe listening later on who don't have the diagram in front of them, that the um, conscious, the unconscious mind, kind of right below the surface of the water, we have a, the potentiator of the mind, the potentiator of the mind. And remember, that's the, the part of the unconscious that is potentiates movement. It, it gets that matrix, which is the conscious mind, getting ready to put things into action. So it's like that Coke bottle that shook up really well, bubbles coming up, it's potentiating and they're coming through the top. Um, but below the potentiator, we have the catalyst of the mind. And remember, catalyst are things that uh, as Ross says, anything that assaults our senses are catalysts. Um, and catalysts come externally to us. They, they may happen to us, but we interpret them, even though it's instantaneous, we interpret them through our unconscious bias, our unconscious way, our unconscious lenses. We interpret things that happen to us. And not only that, but our unconscious and the experience catalyst, I'm sorry, the experienced archetype, that is the sifter, that's the archive. And they, the experience archetype gives us catalyst, internal catalyst. So those, these are sometimes the things that we may think about, these thoughts that come to us, to our conscious mind, where did they come from? They were catalysts. Where did the catalysts come from? From the archive area, the experience, the library. Okay, so we have external, external catalysts that come to us, and we interpret them using our biases, which are located in the experience archetype. And then we also have internal catalysts that come to us, and these are percolating up also from the experience archetype. And they go right into the potentiator archetype. And they start to bubble up, bubble up. And then it breaks through into the surface, into the matrix of the mind. Now, the matrix is the conscience, the conscious area of the mind, the matrix archetype. But we won't do anything in the conscious mind until our significator, and that is the archetype of mind that is responsible for uh, deciding what we're going to do with these archetypes. I mean, sorry, the catalysts and all of that. What are we going to do with the unconscious that comes up? We're going to do something. And why are we going to do something? You know, all of these things, that is what the significator archetype does. Because and the significator means the significant self, um, and it's the meaning self. It's the self that makes meaning of all of these things that come up into the conscious mind. So now we have a sense that's a really quick wrap up of uh, what we have talked about in the past, and we're going to get into, I think, um, one of the more interesting and maybe more relevant. Uh, series of archetypes that 
that Ra talks about, and these are the spiritual archetypes. Okay. Um, so we have the, the spiritual archetype that it's interesting wording, but the law of one says, quote, the significator owns a covenant with the spirit. The significator owns a covenant with the spirit. That's very interesting words. And if you can recall from the Hebrew scriptures or AKA Old Testament, um, can we think of any particular biblical story that, that there was the sense of the covenant? I think we talked a little bit about this maybe last time, but the sense of the covenant um, and that God makes a covenant to God's people. What happened when that was going on? Do you remember the, the particular story in the Bible? Anybody want to say? You can just say it. I can't really see your hand, so you're welcome just to say it. Would that be Abraham? Abraham and Yahweh making the covenant? I think Abraham and Yahweh making the covenant. Also, what about Noah? Noah, yep. And if you recall, Noah uh, was in the ark. The ark could be kind of symbolism of the conscious mind floating on top of the unconscious water. Water is always the arc. It's sort of the mythos of the unconscious in, in cultures, water. So we have the arc going. Um, and then we have the unconscious, which is all the water underneath. But what happened was, if you recall, the, the flood came in. Everything disappeared. It, everything was in chaos. And that could be also some symbology of what happened when the veil was installed into third density, remember the logos, the logoi, uh, the one infinite creator decided to install a veil in third density so that we would have free will, but it acted like all of the jewels of the earth were suddenly covered over the crusted over. So that's almost like that flood. And we were now on top of the water, unable to even see the bottom. So that's, a, that's kind of like that veil, you know, but owning the covenant of the, the significator that our sense of self significator owns a covenant with the spirit. That means uh, in, in sort of different language, that means it is always, always present. Even if we're ever feeling alone or have no resource to, to weather the storms, that that is not true because the spirit is always right there. Okay. So I have it. I've been kind of having fun with some images so you can see that here. <laughs> the spirit uh, looks like a, a bird and um, the bird is actually, this was taken from indeed the archetype that Ra used or that the Egyptian used when they, when Ra communicated the archetypes. That this is, I actually cut it out of that archetype and put it here. So this is what it looks like. Um, and here I've got these two ropes, as you can see, that are attached to the significator. Because the significant, I mean, the spirit is kind of floating off. <laughs> Here's these two ropes. And uh, one might ask, what are these two ropes that are holding uh, the floating spirit at bay? Well, um, Ra says that the <clears throat> spiritual body energy field is a pathway or channel. When body and mind are receptive and open, then the spirit can become a functioning shuttle or communicator from the in entity's individual energy of will upwards and the streamings of the creative fire and wind downwards. Um, and we're going to get to that in just a second. It's really interesting language there. But Ra also says, it is necessary to activate the sense of the spiritual channel or shuttle. And then one more time, the law of one, Ra says, with proper seeking or mind configuration of the significator, that's the 
self that tries to make sense of the world, the power of will, which is the matrix, uses the spirit as a shuttle to contact the appropriate archetypal aspect necessary for teaching or learning. So this this idea of the spirit being a shuttle is an interesting one. Um, And we're going to get into this a little bit later, I think, maybe not tonight, but exactly what the shuttle of the spirit is. And then also to understand, try to understand like what is the overall, if, if the spirit is a shuttle, then how are we understanding uh, the, how to access all of the archetypes of the spirit? Or how are we to understand how to access, for example, dimensions beyond third density? Well, Ross seems to suggest that the analogy is that the spirit is indeed a shuttle that can take you there. But it's not like you're going to get on this little um, bridge and this little uh, floating thing and then fly away. It's more of um, accessing a, a higher sense of um, existence that's beyond the material And there's certain ways to do that. And when one gets practiced at doing these kinds of things, then one can kind of work and and maneuver in the so-called spiritual world using spiritual tactics. And uh, for some adepts, for example, they become so adept at doing these kinds of things that they really do um, function in higher dimensions or different dimensions, even while their body and mind and spirit are here in third density, they can kind of bilocate or trilocate or whatever it is and manifest in other different dimensions or densities simultaneously at will. Um, But I think Ra's analogy of being able to get to that point, there's a shuttle (laughs) that kind of takes you, if you will, higher and higher or more subtle and more subtle, not higher in terms of better, but just more dense in terms of energy and light and um, less dense in terms of material body. Okay, so here we have um, these two ropes that I that I had shown earlier with the significator of the mind. One is will and one is faith. In other words, to put it to you differently, how, how I understand that Ra says that the significator of the mind owns a covenant with the spirit is that the spirit is always there, always present, always connected to the significator. But how you get on board this shuttle is through two things. And this is, Ross says this over and over again in the material in different places. And that is the will and the faith. The will, the purity of will of seeking. How strong is your will to seek, to find, to walk ahead, and then to do it even more and more and more. Just keep moving forward. And do you have, do, do we have a sense of, of faith, faith in even though we may not be able to see where we're going, even if we have the, we don't even know if what we're doing is effective, that we trust that it is, that we trust our journey. Um, and believe it or not, Ross says that that is how one boards the shuttle. So let's say that we have pretty strong faith. And pretty strong will. Well, we could picture that the um, spirit shuttle actually over overshadows or comes upon or boards or lands into the significator. So here's why I have lo- <clears throat> excuse me located on the image. I've located that this um, the spirit shuttle is now on top of the significator. 
And then you can see on the top of the, the image of the spirit shuttle that these little two little things that are kind of on top, on, you know, waving around in different in the opposite directions. I have one called will and one called faith that these actually are kind of the harnesses, if you will, of the spirit shuttle again is will and faith. It's almost like handlebars that you're going to grab a hold of. One is will and one is faith. They're, they're not quite the same, but they're not totally different either. So they're a bit inter interpenetrating. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, on this particular slide, as you can see, I've got the um, labeled out a little bit just so you have some sense. It's not central to what we're talking about tonight, but some sense of um, the different levels of mind, because Ra talks about these, these different levels of mind that are not existing in the conscious. They're existing in the unconscious. And through will and faith and the spirit shuttle, you can start to have access to these things. Um, so the first level is we have the temporary personality unconscious. Now that's not Ra's words. That's actually um, taken from uh, another source of material that I find as effective as Ra's of the law of one. That's called the you know, Daskalos was a great teacher and mystic. And a lot of the uh, Daskalos's Christian mystical um, teachings is actually uh, extraordinarily congruent with the law of one and sometimes more clarifying in my opinion. And so uh, Daskalos talks about how there's a temporary personality unconscious. So who you are today in this body, in this lifetime, would be considered your temporary personality. So there's that level of unconscious. Then you have the permanent personality unconscious that exists below the temporary personality, deeper underwater if we're talking about the iceberg. Below that, we have, oh, let me just say one thing too about the permanent personality unconscious. Ra does refer to that as the significant self. So, for example, when you die and I die in, these, in this body and, or the last life you had, what got passed down to this particular life was what Ra calls the significant self. And that would be all of the lessons distilled from past lives and whatever um, algorithm, karmic algorithm that is packaged up in all of that so that when we are born into these bodies, that sort of gets um, tapped and our scroll of living unfolds as we go along in our life. Um, a lot of that would be uh, tapping into and releasing some of that out that karmic algorithm or, or balancing that we've had in past lives. But that's called the significant self, the meaningful self. Um, and I'm, I'm saying it's the same thing as the permanent personality. Okay. Below the permanent personality unconscious, we have the racial mind. <clears throat> and probably on most planets, uh, the racial mind and the planetary mind would be one and the same thing. But on Earth, according to Ra, uh, Earth is a conglomerate of many different souls coming from different places throughout the galaxy. I think it's something like three major planetary systems and 13 minor ones. So it's, it's, a, it's a motley crew we are <laughs> here. Um, and each different little group would have their own racial mind uh, that is not so much accessed in the conscious way, but um, is nevertheless there deep, deep down inside un, un, in the unconscious. So you may have somebody, for example, that Ra says the uh, Deneb, the, the star system Deneb, that souls came from that system and settled in a certain area on Earth. Then you may have the Martians who blew off their planet, you know, and then were incarnated here 75,000 years ago. That would be another racial uh, group. So there's two racial groups. 
each of them have their own history in their own other planets before coming here. And this may just be to slight biases deep down in the unconscious. But if you put all of that together, then you have the planetary mind. So that could be, for example, like we live in a country called the United States. Every state might be your racial mind having its own identity, and but you put them all together and then you have the United States, which has its own um, sense of self as a country. And that would be the planetary mind if we're talking about an entire planet. Then below that, deeper than that, um, and, and by the way, I don't mean deeper and smaller, I mean deeper and larger. So really, the iceberg should be not getting pointed, but really more expanded out as we go deeper. But the archetypal logoic mind. So this would be the mind that we're talking about right now. The, the different archetypes that Ra gave to us um, or illuminated that exist. Uh, are, are, this is the mind of God. This is the mind of how consciousness is able to be and to understand itself in a third density way and second density and all the way up. Um, so this is that level of construct or architecture of consciousness. And it really is the, the logoic mind, um, the mind of God, that God learns how to be God the creator learns how to be the creator through the creator as us and how we understand ourselves is through the architecture of the archetypes, right? Below that, the archetypal logoic mind, we have the deep logoic mind. Just to give you one example of what the deep logoic mind is, um, uh, Ra says at least three times in the Law of One material that our creator, our logos, meaning our son, um, has a bias towards kindness and a bias towards yeah, kindness, like it, three times. Now, if you look up a synonym for kindness, you have um, compassion. Uh, solidarity, uh, love, sharing, joy. So it, it's interesting because our particular, if you will, um, local God, I know it sounds weird to say perhaps, but th the way that our particular, the let's say the, the galactic logos gives out its plan of how life will unscroll and then our sub logos the sun takes that template blueprint if you will and then tweaks it not because the plan needed to be tweaked but because the sun says i want to give the creator even more experience of being itself i also want to experience myself through this creation, and I I have a particular bias towards kindness. So that's a really interesting thing. Um, Ra does say that other logoic uh, entities, other, maybe you could say other sun bodies of different planets in the galaxy, have a neutral bias, a more neutral bias, which means there would be less of a sense of of natural kindness. Um, not that that lo that logos is evil or mean or anything like that, but it, these are just small little tweaks on um, on giving a certain kind of bias or structure so that when life evolves, it it has a higher probability of evolving in a certain way. Let's see, in a certain way. Not because there's a control aspect to it, but more of it's the, the joy of it creating infinitely requires finite tuning. <laughs> you know, if everything is a white color, uh, 
which contains all the colors, then there's no experience. So we do have to have some of the hues, and the differences. Okay, but below that deep logoic mind, we have the cosmic mind. And this would be the uh, the octave mind or the, the, the mind that created all of the galaxies, you see. So we have these different levels of mind and it is all one mind that are nuanced in a hierarchical order. But the real work of consciousness is third density. And Ra says that once the veil was put into place in third density, that third density becomes the axis upon which the creation turns. That's pretty powerful words. And that's because our experiences, your experiences, mine, the joys and the struggles, the the known and the unknown, these are all things that are totally novel. If you don't have a veil, everything is known. But if you have a veil, it's all novel experience creating an, an intensity of, of uh, existence. And that is the highest level of glory given to the creator imaginable. So the creator is in us, is us, is through us experiencing all of our lives um, in intense love uh, and delight and sorrow. All the things that you and I feel are the feelings of the infinite creator because it is through you and me, the infinite creator experiences itself. It really is a great concept, incredibly beautiful when we think about it. Um, okay, moving along. Here we have <clears throat> kind of what happens when we've got the will and faith. You grab in the handlebars, will and faith, and you know, it's like I really want to do something with my life. I I want to take this step forward. And what, what happens on a metaphysical level, there's some sort of like, oh, I don't know, tractor beam. <laughs> I mean, I'm using all of these analogies, right? But it's like this in, a tractor beam thing that just moves forward up and out and grabs uh, this ability to conceptualize, see without the eyes in my head, but seeing through the heart, um, which the Greeks called the nous, N-O-U-S, the nous. And it actually meant heart mind. So really it's, if you want to look at it in terms of linear area, it's it's the third eye, it's the sixth chakra. It's the, Ra talks about the uh, indigo ray as being the ray of the adept, which is the ray the adepts use f will and faith to, to do adept work, to do spiritual work. The adept works in the spiritual archetypes. Um, but how that might actually look, look like uh, in reality is going to be less in the sixth chakra and more like a Taurus field, which has its, its exploding out and it's coming in right in the center, you know, so, and that's your heart. And so this torrid field, this Taurus um, just gets brighter, you know, it gets way more strong when we start to grab a hold of the handlebars of will and faith and, pull on them in earnest. <clears throat> so it, it can, it starts to come, the sense of coming over us, you know, overshadowing. And in the biblical imagery, we see Mary talking about how the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. We talk about in the Hebrew scriptures, there was this sense of the overshadowing of God's spirit over the temple. Um, there's a couple of places where this is seen. Uh, another one would be the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus walks up to the hill. There was this sense of an overshadowing of clouds. And then it, there's illumina illumination. We have Jesus in a transfigured kind of body, along with um, two other important biblical figures. So what we have here is this real sense of will and faith taking that first step does create a type of transfiguration. It's almost like we're living in a different universe there. That's why I have it pulled down um, over the significator of the mind. 
because that's the mind that makes sense of things, if you recall. Hey, Doug, if I if I could add, um, I was uh, talking with Troy, I think it was yesterday or the day before we were talking about this idea of the anointing. And uh, this I, I had this dream last week that um, a friend of mine who was a teacher, <clears throat> he's talking about this idea of anointing and the anointing and what is the anointing. And we've heard that word that before the anointing and it's the anointing that breaks the yoke, the word Christ uh, as translated as the anointed one and his anointing. And uh, as I was w- working on and dwelling on it and meditating on it, one of the thoughts that I, I had in the idea of the anointing, it kind of re- this kind of smacks, it reminds me of it so to a bit that um, it's almost like a type of alignment that if it could be uh, manifested in the spiritual, that the anointing is not something that's from the outside that comes upon us. Because that's, that's what I've always had my visual picture. But the way I felt the Spirit spoke it to me and taught me this past week was that the anointing was, it's from the inside and it flows out. And this was the idea of the inside flows out was the alignment of like, it got, like he got really simple with it and like physical of saying, okay, when you have the right uh, measure or recipe of serotonin, oxytocin, like all of the feel-good hormones that develops a type of flow state. And in that flow state, there is a flow of the anointing. So what we say and call the anointing, others, Chick sent me highly, he would call it flow state, um, you know, and getting into the flow. And that is something that's on the inside side that boom bubbles out explodes it's kind of big bang ish but it's ultimately a type of alignment cosmic cosmically that physically you know we initiate with the the very hormones that are on on the inside that are created in the heart right and not only that fred you're right on and not only that uh it's the will and faith that you pull on to get you into the flow state. It, it, it's, so what you're saying is that it was coming, it was always inside you. That's true. And we awaken to what is already there. Ra talks about how we activate that which was always in potentiation. Yes. Yeah. So, so go ahead. No, I was just saying so good. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Now, our third density mind, sometimes it's helpful to see that something descends upon us or comes to us externally. But you're actually right. The shuttle of the spirit is not something we get into. It's something that we awaken uh, enough to be able to enjoy, but it's already been always parked right there inside the heart. The, the, the shuttle idea hit me as well. It smacks of the two, two, thing, two instances in scripture. One was Jacob, of course, when he was at Bethel, and he fell asleep and he woke up and he saw this type of escalator or ladder that he called, and there was this ascending and descending, okay? And then Jesus meeting Nathaniel, and he said, you're gonna see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, this up and down. And so I think about those things, and I see those as like the fluids that are in the spine that are going up and down, uh, hitting and visiting and, and opening up the chakras. So that's kind of some of my thoughts on that. I, I don't know if anybody else kind of identifies or, or, or um, you know, resonates with that as well, but that's kind of my thought. Oh, that's awesome. Some, something that stands out to me is just the, those lines where Jesus maybe says, you know, your faith healed you. Maybe there are these moments where the people he's healing have a moment in his presence where they are tapping into their will and faith and opening maybe intelligent energy that's already awake inside of them. So that's, that's actually, there's no other way it happens except for what you just said. Um, Mm. Jesus doesn't, Jesus and other healers do not heal. What they do is that they're crystallized, uh, crystals basically living crystals that 
help with the healing catalyst, but who actually does the healing is the person asking for healing through will and faith. And here's the interesting thing. They may put their will and faith into somebody, say, like Jesus. In other words, I have such strong faith that you, Jesus, can heal me, and I have such strong will to seek you so that you can heal me, is indeed healing, and it looks like it's coming from Jesus, but the will and faith that it happened, because Jesus would be a crystallized entity, or a healer could be, you know, a crystallized entity, that it is um, the person's own will and faith, even if it's directed at, let's say, um, a person or an object, um, it is through the faculties of the will and faith that they're healed. Because that, that's how healing happens. Right, it's the person right, that yeah. heals the, the, the self through the, perhaps the catalyst of the, the healer, who the more crystallized they are, acts as a, a channel of intelligent energy incarnated right here in third density. And then it's just easier access that it's transposed into the other incarnated third density being. Um, but how you get that healing to happen if you're the person is through your own will and faith. Uh, okay, so, you know, once you have the will and faith and you start to explore these different bodies um, and different logoic minds and deep minds and cosmic minds, it's not like that, again, descends upon you. It's just that you awaken more and more through will and faith using the spirit shuttle which is in your heart, to explore what is you because you are the one infinite creator. So it's, it's kind of like your consciousness moves from the individual person that you are to a larger space that is, I mean, larger mind and then even a larger mind. And you, you, can, kind, you can start to learn uh, who you really are at the deeper levels, which is the one infinite creator, which has a hierarchical um, structuring in in the minds. So it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I would say the law of one, why so many of us are, are attracted to it. And of course, you don't have to be attracted to the law of one. You can be, a, it's whatever spiritual... Um, avenue does it for somebody but if it helps catalyze you to wake up to the mysterious and pull on those dual handlebars of the will and faith um, to go forward then that's what uh, is needed it's just a catalyst to get you in and, and in fact, as a side note, this is why Ross said that a lot of the Confederation show up in their UFOs, that when the Confederation shows up in visible UFOs, if it is from the Confederation and not from Orion, for example, then it is because it is an awakening of that person who's seeing it into the mysterious, into that which is bigger than this material world, into a state of awe and wonder. And that is enough to be a little breadcrumb, a little question mark. And I want to follow. I have the will to follow. And I'm trusting my will. And I really want to go. So I'm getting stronger and stronger will. And I'm trusting it's going to lead me somewhere. And that's faith. So here is the whole spiritual journey. The next few slides are the whole spiritual journey. In my, in my understanding, it's, it is really, truly uh, not that foreign to us. I think that the archetypes were given to a people, even though they are incredibly profound. They were given to a people several thousand years ago who may have been less distorted in their ways. Le they had less wrinkles in their thinking, you know how like a child, if you look at their brain, their brain is kind of smooth. It doesn't have a lot of wrinkles. Um, but then you see like a brain of, oh, I don't know, Troy um, or Martha. And 
you just go on and on here. Fred, I'm sure you're just a, a wrinkly old bastard in the brain. But, you know, like the older and wiser you are, it's just, just the, the brain has got all these wrinkles, you know. Um, that's distortions. So we are more distorted than the Egyptians were, Ross says. But we also have a way more comprehension of complexity. So, for example, a lot of these things like the pyramids, as in, I mean, I'm in a pyramid, you know, it's kind of my muse right now. I'm, I'm going crazy a little bit, but it's, it's these pyramids, I mean, Ross says the time of the pyramid is over. Why? Because they were training wheels to get people to do what, to be honest with you, kind of what we do in counseling or good spiritual work. If you're talking to someone who knows what they're saying and doing and the real depths, that's kind of what the pyramids were supposed to be doing, except at more of aggressive kind of healing or aggressive seeking that helped train a person so that they can finally do it themselves. And here's actually, here's one way I was thinking about it. You may know from somebody who's going to rehab I'm not talking about alcohol rehab, but like uh, physical rehab. Maybe you've seen it where they're trying to learn how to walk better. They will often be put into um, like machine legs, right? So their legs are being put into machine legs and then the machine legs do the walking for them. Do you see like this um, and your feet go and, you, and you're doing the motions of walking, even though it's not your body doing it. And one of the reasons why is because that starts to route the nerves, you know, but the machines are routing the nerves and creating the nerves to move and repair themselves. And then eventually the goal is, is that you remove slowly remove those, um, those mechanical legs. And then you start to actually do it on your own through your own will and faith and walking and trying. So it, it's, it's kind of like, we want you to walk. We know you can't. Here's how you can do it with these, this mechanical system. We're going to get it going, go, 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 go. And then eventually you learn and you reprogram your mind and you learn and then slowly remove these away and you can go on your journey. But that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, which is what you and I are used to is, freaking trying to do something, failing, getting back up, trying to do it, but learning, hopefully failing a little bit, you know, the three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. And if you're really listening to our suffering and listening to our great love, we, we would be progressing, learning how to walk in this journey um, in a more organic kind of way. So there's two ways to arrive, let's say, in our, my analogy of walking mechanical, then remove those things to get to where you're walking on your own or learning to walk on your own as a kid, falling down, getting back up, falling down, getting back up, getting to where you're an adept at walking. There's, you see what I'm saying? And Doug, and Doug, you're saying the pyramid is the first one, right? I'm saying the pyramid and things like that, including these archetypes in a way, well, not quite the archetypes, but yeah, um, the pyramid was like that. That's what I'm saying. Sure. Okay. But what I am saying too is that these spiritual archetypes are not that unfamiliar because what I'm going to be talking about are good, um, solid spiritual things. Hang on a second. My sweet catalyst of a dog. Go, go do your thing. Okay. So we have this old room. And we have the new room on the other side, and we have liminal space in the middle. So we have a, a diagram here where there's an old room on the left and new room on the right. And in between, there's a small hallway, and that's called liminal space. Um, and the liminal space is pressured from above and below the pressure. And, it, and it, so it, it's like when you're in there, it's a, it's a compression chamber. It's a pressure chamber. It's really hard to walk in that. 
Uh, and the pressure is suffering and great love. Suffering and great love. Kind of like I'm suffering right now since my kids think it's nice to do a drum circle in the other room. So they're just drumming away. But you work with what you got. Um, okay. <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting is this journey seemingly upwards. Now, as uh, Fred had said earlier, it's it's not like you you have to walk somewhere and then have an external things will have an ex external destination. It's more of through your life's journey, you awaken. If we're doing it right, you're awakened to more and more expansive seeing the heart opens more and more. And by the way, the biblical word for that, does anybody know what the biblical word for that is? I'm going to take a wild guess. Is it sanctification? Um, it might be, but the, the word that I, that I know is metanoia. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. Does that mean repentance? It does. Um, it, it's conversion and repentance are the words that metanoia is translated, but conversion and repentance have a bad rap because it's like, you know, you must convert to my religion and you must repent from your bad deeds. Right. Yeah. But, but that's not ever what it was supposed to mean. It really means open your open your mind, see more broadly, see the complexity, hold the tension more and more and more. That's metanoia. Meta means change. Noia means heart mind. And that's the journey. So you can see on this diagram, it's these arrows that swig, uh, that, that go back and forth in greater and greater expansiveness from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo and finally to purple and how it registers on our own physical bodies are these particular energy energy um, centers that begin to harmonically resonate with our ability to see you know like if you were to play an, an E chord on one guitar and in, all of a sudden sympathetic resonance goes through the air and starts to play the E chord on the other guitar that's parallel without you touching it. And so that's what the energy centers are is that they remain dormant or in potential in potentiation until our will and faith and life experiences brings us to a place where we're capable, we're ready to see more expansively. And at that point, it starts to resonate sympathetically, sympathetic resonance, um, that our outside and our inside and our ability to see everything resonates so that it becomes open and activated. And that is a higher seeing. So, and we just go up, theoretically, up from root to crown. The more we see, the, more, the, the higher the energy center is open so that we can live life from a more expansive place, ongoing metanoia. And the journey, if, if we look down here at the very bottom, um, we have our little uh, diagram of the old room, liminal space, and the new room. The new room means the room that I will be moving into once I'm transformed, once I'm listening to my pain in liminal space or able to deal with awe and wonder. And if I follow that with will and faith, then it opens me up into a new place. So for example, um, let's say I'm an alcoholic and uh, I finally say I've got to stop drinking because it's ruining my life. It's ruining my family's life. So let's say I, 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 I go back and I start, I start liminal space living. I'm leaving the old room. I close the door and I'm like, Oh shit, this is hard. You know, uh, at that point I can either open back up the door of the old room, go back in and redecorate it and say, why did I ever leave? Pass me a whiskey. 
Uh, I'm not saying whisk drinking is wrong. I'm just saying, you know, and do you use this example. Or I can keep the door closed using will and faith. I'm going to march forward, even though I don't know what the hell sobriety looks like. I'm just going to go forward with it, crawling at this point, you know, S- through suffering, great love, and constant surrender. That's the momentum forward through the liminal space. Eventually, that opens up into a transformed way of living, and that's called the new room. And so, as we can see, it just starts going all the way up. And as we journey higher and higher, it's also a rotating kind of journey. So, even though you might be going, say, from yellow activated chakra to the heart chakra, the way you get there is itself a spiral. Three steps forward, two steps back. Three steps forward, two steps. It's never not three steps forward, two steps back. You see? But you slowly inch yourself up higher and higher and higher. Doug, an observation that I have in my own life is that there are macro liminal spaces that I experience where they'll, they'll last, I can look back, maybe it lasted eight to 10 months, a, a year and a half. And now there are liminal spaces that I have that last 30, 45 seconds. Maybe it's dealing with a old habit or an mm-hmm. old pattern. And you said suffering, great love. And that third one, that surrender, it's almost like the catalysts can become stronger, but it's like a roller coaster that you, you have the will and faith to determine how like it's going to be a bumpy ride, but the more you can surrender to the ride and have that will and faith, the quicker you can come out of that liminal space, even though the catalysts never really stop, but you, when you can, because you can have will and faith and still resist the, you know, the, the lessons that you're being taught, but that surrender can get you out of that liminal space more often. Like there's some, but what I'm trying to say is there's a macro um, diagram. Then there are these old room and new rooms that, you know, happen on a more micro level too. And what you're saying is beautiful because Ra also says that the more and more an adept a person becomes, the more humble they become, the more crystallized they become where it's no longer their will, but the infinite creator's will working in and through them. And in other words, liminal space living becomes much more smooth because like, let's say, as Ignatius of Loyola used to say, do all things for the glory of God. Like everything, if you're going to wash a dish, do it for the glory of the creator. You know what I mean? Like everything is done single pointedly towards my chosen polarity. The more you do that, the liminal space becomes a smoother ride. And what you end up learning, if you really want to go on the warp speed through it, is that you learn that the old room, uh, sorry, the new room eventually becomes an, a new old room and then you go through liminal space again and that opens up into a new room which then becomes a new old room as you go up the spiral so what you end up learning at the very you know at some point the adepts let's say you learn that liminal space is actually the only room oh shit you learn to live right there because and, and so then it's like a rapid sort of warp speed because once you learn to live in a total surrendered humility, um, humble kind of way right there in the middle, then it's like the new room and old room just kind of like spin around and it's all one thing. The new room is the old room and, and it just keeps on going all the way through and you're standing there, let's say, to use biblical imagery – both crucified, like I'm willing to be crucified upon the moment of my vulnerability and simultaneously resurrected. Like crucified and resurrected is not A and B. It's they're, they're, It's not A, then long space B. It's A and B together are two sides of the same coin, not two coins. 
uh, just rotating, you see. And that's, the, you know, a Christian notion, let's say, of, of living a, a saintly life, but that would be what we Ross says is living a like sort of high level adepthood is that one totally surrenders their life completely and you make your home upon the rocks of liminal space, not the sands of either the old room or the new room. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Um, Next week, we're going to jump into, we're going to take this and go a little bit deeper. So I I hope you're ready for that liminal space ride. (laughs) Would somebody like to close this out? I think Fred has a liminal wrap for us. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I was thinking liminal space with (laughs) lemons to aid, making lemonade in liminal space. He can... Liminal, liminal, liminal aid. There it is. Liminal aid. Liminal <laughs> aid. That's the name of the rap right there. Liminal aid. And is it a R-A-P or W-R-A-P, Fred? Both. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. It's both end. Because if you learn anything by being in liminal space long enough, it's go for both ends. Don't go for <laughs> Beautiful. Well, let's go ahead and pray. All let's right. Ah. Uh, mm. So, Daddy, I just had this this image of being in the birth canal and how the the squeezing of the birth canal pushed us from one space to the new space. Um and Maybe this third density is a birth canal on a big, big, scaled out level. That being the case, we recognize, just as the psalmist said, that you knew us deep within the belly, deep within the unseen parts. You knew our name. You knit, you knit us together in the dark. And even in the squeezing, all is well. So we just rest in that. And we thank you for being with us. Thank you for thinking of us. And thank you for getting us through the squeeze and the liminal space. All of your wonderful names we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody. Can't wait to see you next week and have a a blessed time in the liminal space this week. Everybody's in it, so let's embrace it.